You guys, two weeks ago, we had leadership gathering. And uh, it was leadership training, which was Friday night, all day Saturday and Sunday. And uh, God sovereignly broke into that weekend. And over that weekend, everything that I had planned to do, God shifted and changed it. Even Sunday that I preached two weeks ago, and thank you, Pastor Mark, for ministering the word last week with excellence. We thank you, and we honor the pastors of this house. But I need to frame where I believe God wants me to go this morning by catching you up a little bit, those of you that are partners of this house and maybe visiting this house. But two weeks ago, usually at the beginning of the year, we meet with the leaders and we share, this is the direction that God is calling us to go in 2024. And over that weekend, the Lord just broke in. And if I were to sum it up, the Lord spoke to me and he spoke to us and he said, TCMI, I want you to go back to the original mandate of this house. Now, I'm just going to take two minutes, but 23 years ago, I had left Amsterdam and come back to Jamaica, and I had done a, a number of very large, I'd like the young people to stay in here, the youth need to stay in church. I had done a number of very large um, crusades in different places in the world, and all of a sudden, God began to close a lot of doors. And I set myself to seek God. And I was living in Kingston with my family, with my mom and dad. And uh, I went into a season of prayer and into a season of fasting. And as I went into that season, I had a visitation from God. And in that visitation, without going into the details of it this morning, it was one of those defining moments in my life, in my calling, and in who I was a, as a person. And from that visitation, I realized the reason I was born. And the Lord said to me that afternoon when he came into my room, he took me through the chambers of history and I saw the revivals of Wesley, the revivals of Finney and Zuzu Street. And he said, Mary, I want you to go to the west of Jamaica. And I want you to, and these were quote, unquote, raise up a people that will carry my glory. For where my glory is, there my judgment shall be also. And I packed two suitcases. And I had never, I didn't know anybody in Montego Bay except for one couple that I did not know well. And I packed two suitcases with no money. But I had a call and I had a mandate. And I'd never, ever even been to Doctor's Cave Beach in my teenage years. The only thing I knew about Montego Bay was I drove through Montego Bay to go to Negril. But this house, I want us to understand that this house and this ministry has been raised up, meaning God sent me here, and we are called by God to carry the glory of God. And as we set ourselves at the beginning of the year to seek him, he said, I want that in this year, and I believe this is something and where we're going for the rest of the, my life, that God has sent me here to raise up a people that would carry his glory. The glory of God, I want to define it this morning quickly is very different than the anointing of God. So it means if God has sent you to this house, you're called to carry the glory. The anointing of God, you can be anointed, cast out demons and heal the sick and live in sin. There are many individuals that are anointed, but when the day of reckoning comes, God will say, I know you not. And they'll say, but I cast out demons in your name. And I heal the sick in your name. And God will say, I don't know you. Because God's definition and God's standard 
is not meant in an anointing. It's meant in who we are, representatives of him. I'm good. I'll just stay in one place. Is it the mic okay? The glory of God is the manifest presence of God that leads to transformation. And this morning, I'm just going to take my time. But I want us this morning, by the grace of God and by the word of God, to have a moment of honesty and to have a moment of truth. I'm not interested this morning in preaching a message that makes us jump and shout. And I want to be clear this morning, I'm not preaching at anybody in here. My words are not aimed at you. It's his words that are aimed at us and at the church at large. Amen? And uh, two weeks ago, the Lord said, pick up your pen, tent pegs. What does that mean? Everything that this house has done and been in the past, we give him praise and honor for. But he said, the cloud is moving. I want you to move forward now. And it means that we're not going to define where we're going from where we were at. And whenever the Lord says, pick up your tent pegs and move from here, it means change is coming. The cloud has moved. So look at your neighbor say, change is coming. Change must come. Listen, let me just wake you up. This morning a little bit, I was talking to somebody in the office this week, and if you're not aware, you see, we stay current with CNN or NCB or news and what's happening in the world, but many times we don't stay what's current with what's happening in the church globally. And right now, we need to be on alert because God is judging the house of Saul. He's judging the house of Samuel. He's judging the house of Eli. But God is merciful because before he judges, he gives us opportunity to repent. He's a merciful God. He's a good God. He's a kind God. And this morning, I want you to understand that that goes for each of our lives. It says his mercy triumphs over his judgment. And whenever he, we go off inside of God, he'll correct us privately three times. Then he'll correct us publicly and three times. And then he begins to discipline us. And this is the love of God. But all across the nations of the earth, God is preparing his bride for his second coming. Oh my gosh, I should get an amen for that. But how many of you are his bride? Oh, I can't hear you. I, I, I just feel we need to just stay there for a moment. How many viewers? But he's preparing his bride. Oh, I feel we need to just take a moment right there. He's preparing his bride. And he's coming back for a bride without spot. Come on, church. He's coming back for a bride without wrinkle. He's coming back for a bride that is on fire for him. He's coming back for a bride that loves him passionately. He's coming back for a bride that has dealt with her idols. He's coming back for a bride that's wholeheartedly and single-heartedly devoted to him. The Bible says that before he comes, the cry of the bride will be in the earth. And the cry of the bride comes from a deep belly place that says, Come, Lord Jesus, come. I'm hungry for you. And so God is cleaning house. I was talking to a staff this week, and they, they follow certain things, and they were sharing with me. They were saying, you know, Mary, it's unbelievable about what's happening in certain denominations and certain houses you see God exposing the sin of leadership you see God giving leadership an opportunity to either remain wrapped in pride or to repent amen repentance is really a gift from God you guys it's not a slap on the wrist it's a gift from God to change our ways 
And this individual staff was sharing with me about some of the pastors in another country that this one pastor, he was saying, why is my church not growing? And in this nation, there are a lot of very large churches. And you see, modern day Christianity has defined success by the size of the church. How many people are attending your church defines whether that church is successful or blessed by God. And this one pastor went to his bishop and he said, how come your church is growing but my church is not growing? And this bishop began to say to him, well, if you want your church to grow, there's some things that you have to do. And he went to a high-level person that's involved in witchcraft and occult. This is a true story, pastor. And he says, if you will sleep with a mermaid, never preach repentance. Never preach holiness. But only preach prosperity and blessing. Your church will grow. And this pastor was chasing after success in the eyes of man. Instead of success in the eyes of God. And so he went into the realm of the spirit and had demonic sex with a mermaid. And he stopped preaching holiness. He stopped preaching consecration. He preached blessing and prosperity. And guess what began to happen, you guys? His church began to grow. And then to maintain the growth, he had to have sex with a virgin every month. Eventually, after a couple of years of living like that, he said, I can't do this anymore. He understood that he might have numbers and money and wealth, but he didn't have God. Modern day church culture has made us at ease in Zion. That we have reduced God and reduced the word of God to a checklist of things that we do as Christians. A list of good things. A list of right things to appease God. When we begin to sit back and, and take a look in the mirror. And you know, every one of us needs to look in the mirror before we come out of the house. But we need to look in a God mirror. And it's a mercy of God, and it's a goodness of God that holds up a mirror. And as I was studying this week, and before God, I found myself this week crying out to God, God, give me a heart that's on fire for you. I want to make a statement, and if you take notes, write it down. Religion, programs, platforms, protocols, and personalities have stolen raw, undiluted passion. I'm going to take my time, even if I get through half the message, because I need to bring understanding. Religion. <laughs> Protocols. Personalities and programs have stolen raw, undiluted desire, passion for God. The Bible said that David was a man after God's own heart. Are we after his heart? I realize, and again, I'm not preaching at you, but many of us, I'll use the word us, many of us don't know how to praise him. Many of 
us don't know how to worship God. Many of us come to church and we know how to keep a program. We know how to big up a personality. We like this one's praise and this one's preaching and this one's word and that one word. But we've lost sight of God. And so check, I did church. Check, I did prayer meeting. But the issue is, do we know God? Do we know the God of the Bible? And so we try to appease him. It's out of our heart because we've not been taught anything different. So again, I'm not preaching to anybody in here, but I'm declaring to principalities and powers, enough is enough. We will not live the lie. We will not walk out the deception. This house will not be the house of Saul. This house will not be the house of Samuel. This house will not be the house of Eli. This house will be the house of God, whatever the cost. By his grace. And so we have level one Christians. We call them in Jamaica, yeah man, we are God fearing. I fear God, but I don't want anything to do with God, much less church. Some of you are online. We have level two Christians, and I could unpack this, but I don't want to stay here, that are religious. I want to be a good person. I just want to be good. I don't want to kill anybody. I don't want to have adultery. I don't want to commit fornication. I don't want to lie. I just want to be good. But don't mess with my life. Church is not something I do, not who I am. Oh, I need somebody to just war with me this morning against the lies of the enemy. And then when the time of reckoning comes and you knock at the gates of heaven, God's going to say, who are you? And you're going to say, I went to church. And God said, but I don't know you. I don't know your voice. I don't know who you are. Church cannot save you. Baptism cannot save you. We believe in Jamaica, I'll be baptized. Let me tell you, salvation is an ongoing, continuous relationship with the Lord that is walked out throughout a lifetime when he comes into our heart and he begins to take control of our lives. And then you have level two Christians that, yeah, man, I want to develop my gift. I want to serve God. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with it. But they don't really want the God of the Bible. They want to redefine God to who they want him to be. And they'll serve a God that they have created in their own image and in their own likeness. We need to stop and ask ourselves in a nation that has more churches. Oh God, somebody help me. We have more churches per square mile than any other nation in the earth. We are in the Guinness Book World of Records. There's a church upon every corner in a Jamaica. And everybody don't have the title, pastor, apostle, prophet, teacher, this, that, to the. We need to stop and we need to ask ourselves, if we have more churches per square mile than any other nation, why are we a nation that's washed in blood? Why are we a nation that's washed in crime and violence? Why is the corruption of our government been permitted to continue? Why is Generation X generation me z the omega generation addicted to the crack cocaine of social media they don't know how to pray they don't know how to seek god they don't know how to worship god what are we doing my bible says that our praise is not to appease the flesh. Come on, somebody help me war. 
Do we want the next generation to really know God? I can't hear your cry, but I can hear the cry of God in heaven. Help me, Lord. Help me, God. Help me this morning, Lord. The church. The church are the doorkeepers. Somebody help me. To the nation. What the body of Christ permits will be permitted. And what we do not permit will not be permitted. There's a battle going on in the heavenlies that is not against flesh and blood. It's not against political parties. It's not about JLP or PNP. It is a battle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And the only army that has a weaponry to bring the enemy down is the army of God. And it's time for the army of God to arise. You think homosexuality, sin, lesbianism, murder and crime, it's a principality. Listen, I'm not preaching at you. I really am not. We drag ourselves to church late. We can't, we don't understand. I want to, we don't understand praise and worship. So if they sing good and I feel good, we feel we have achieved something. Have we? Have we? Listen, I'm, I'm not preaching to anybody here. Church has become a fashion show. And there are people that don't want to come to church because they don't have church clothes. I release you to wear your jeans. Just be modest. There are times you just need to be humble before the Lord. And you need to understand that we're not here for a fashion show. We're here to be a weapon in the army of God, in the hand of God. We're here to execute vengeance on the enemy, to punish the devil. And my Bible says, if we lift up the name of Jesus, oh, not an artist, not a worship leader, not a praise person, not a performance, but if we lift up the name of Jesus, Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. Somebody lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, church. You're not here. Stand up and lift up his name. Say, Jesus, be lifted up over my life. Be lifted up over my children. Be lifted up over my finances. I think you can do better than that. I think you have more of a push than that. You want me to fight for you. It's time we fight together. Time we understand who our enemy is. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus for our schools, for Cornwall College. For Mount Alvernium, for Comstee, for the public schools, for the private schools, will we let the harvest die in the fields? Somebody shout shift. Come on, help me. I'm not preaching at you. Somebody shout shift. Say shift, shift. You can sit down. David was a king. You see, our oh Lord, help me, help me today. Help me. I don't reach very far in my message. David was a king, but he was not too dignified to give up God all. Oh, Lord, do I go there? 
some of us feel we have too big of a name, too big of a position, too big of, too big of a title. To give God all. But you see, David's heart was after God. But the modern day church has raised up a church whose heart is not after God. Okay. And so David found himself, listen, this man. He danced before God with all his might. He was zealous for the name of Yahweh. Do our hearts burn for him, guys? He pursued God passionately. He wrote the majority of the Psalms. Psalms of judgment, Psalms of lament, Psalms of high praise. You see him write things like this one day in your courts is better than, oh, I'm not preaching to anybody in here, but many of us say twice a month I'll attend church. That's okay, that's your choice. But that was in the heart of David. He was zealous for the house of God. I said, God, consume me with zeal for the house of God. He says, one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul long for you oh God my heart and my flesh cry out to see you in the sanctuary this was the heart of David I sat down this week and I said it's absolutely scary to me and it's absolutely terrifying to me that the longer we're Christians and the longer we do church life and the longer that we've walked with God the more casual we become with him Oh, come on, church. We learn the program of religion. We know how to put on a church personality. We understand how to do this and to do that. But in the midst of the doing and in the midst of the program and in the midst of the putting on, we've lost our It's scary to me is to be at ease in Zion. Easy it is to follow programs and patterns and how easy it is to, to put these things on and follow platforms. Yet we're not following God. And how much of the church, the modern day church, has lost, listen, their pastors, I don't, prophets, in the, prophets in this nation that are advocating sex before marriage. There are pastors in this city that are raping girls in their congregation. And they get up and preach. This should not be so. Where is the cry? Where is the outrage? Where is the desperation for the holiness of God? For the presence of God? Who is willing to contend for the holiness of God? For the presence of God? For the throne of God? For the glory of God? To be in the midst of a city, in the midst of a nation. Many of us, if we're honest, we've lost our raw cry. <laughs> I just need to just stay there and let the holy... Many of us have lost our raw cry. God, I want more of you. God, I'm hungry for you. God, I'm desperate for you. And guys, the reality is the modern day church has accommodated this. We preach the self-help gospel. We preach the gospel mixed with flesh and called it fire. We preach the gospel and a loud worship that has holy for mixture, meaning I'm down doing a gig on Friday night at a secular place to earn a buck. Let me tell you, trust God for your life. Trust God for your money, but don't compromise your gifting. Oh, I got to feed my family. God, my, I don't know about you, but my God is called Jehovah Jireh. He provides and he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. See, one of the things a modern day church needs to reckon with. Will I allow God to sanctify and consecrate my worship, my word, my intercession? Modern day church culture has become dysfunctional. 
And church, this is our reality this morning. It must be dismantled. I don't know about you, who's willing to dismantle the dysfunction? Who's willing to war against anything that wars against God? Who's willing to war against anything that wars against the word of God? Who's willing to participate in the pulling up of the tent pegs and the dysfunction and the flesh and the mixture must stop that God might be God? We've exchanged pure worship to worship that appeases the flesh of the listener. We've exchanged the sound of heaven. We don't even hear the sound of heaven. And we've traded it in for the sounds of men. We've exchanged compromise. We've exchanged holy fire for compromise. We've exchanged obedience for convenience. We've exchanged consecration for consideration of demonic ideologies. We've touched the unholy, then lifted our hands in worship. We've consumed a diet of self and social media instead of consuming a diet of the word of God. We spend more time online and on social media than we do on our knees. We minister to the needs of man, meaning some of me have done it, rather than the needs of God. We've entertained eyes idols at the expense of God in our life. We've called church attendance. I went to worship. You can attend church and not worship God. We've called one hour of a prayer meeting sacrifice. We've excused our disobedience for business. We've traded the fear of God for cultural relevance and acceptance. God never called us to be relevant nor to be accepted by modern day church. He says he has called us out out to be a holy people consecrated holy unto him we don't change relevance let me just go through this we no longer I ain't talking to you say so she's not talking to me but we're talking to demons today we no longer know how to give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name Make sure, pastor, keep it two hours. Make sure not to get too passionate. Make sure to be politically correct. Don't offend anybody. And make sure you dare not correct anybody. Preach prosperity. Preach blessing. Preach joy. Preach peace. Prostitute your gift. Lay hands. Slay them in the spirit. Don't preach holiness. Don't preach sacrifice. Don't preach prayer. Don't preach a fear of the Lord and your church will be full. Not here. No more. In the name of Jesus. No more. We do Christianity right. We do church while the enemy rages in our nation. But no man, it's not our responsibility. Don't get involved in politics, Pastor Mary. Definitely don't call out sin in the nation, Pastor Mary. Yeah, that's not your role. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The prophets of old in the new, old and the new testament were called to call out sin, unrighteousness, injustice, and iniquity. And every one of you are a prophet. And while we run our programs, and while we have our services, there's a generation that's lost. There's a generation whose hearts are hardened to the Lord. Generation Z and the Omega generation is addicted. We have an addiction problem in this generation. And it's not just with our young people. It's with the majority of. We are addicted to social media. We are addicted to Instagram. Addicted to dopamine. Addic yeah, what do you do when you scroll? You get a dopamine hit. And so we're scrolling and allowing all these things 
But oh my God, tell me to come out to prayer meeting. You must be crazy. I don't have the time. But when you look at how much time you spend on social media, an hour is nothing, two hours is nothing, three hours is nothing. Meanwhile, our children are being fed by the world, fed by the, the prophets of Baal, fed by Egypt. Come on now. Parents, we need to stand up and we need to combine and we need to war. Oh, I can't hear you. Come on, we're the people of God. Our children, you tell them to pray. They don't know how to pray. You tell them to worship. They don't know how to worship. You tell them to give. They don't know how to give God glory. But oh my God. It's a drug. This is a crack cocaine of this generation. And now, I don't know, Jeff Bezos and these guys want to put this in here. And we become altered humans. Where's the church? Can I hear your cry? Where's the outrage? I can't hear you. Where's the anger? We lull our children into hell. Come on. We put our bedrooms on social media. We've lost our dignity. It's all about us. Can't hear you. But oh, tell me to worship. Tell me to war. No, 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 no. Not here to entertain you. Come on, cry out. blood of Jesus who will cry out who will say no who will say enough is enough we have allowed the world to parent them God knows I'm guilty as well But I say no more. No more. No more. And then we wonder why we have mental health problems. We wonder why autism is rampant. Come on now. I can't hear your church. We wonder. Why so many personality disorders are in the church? They're addicted to dopamine. Hit, 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 hit. While we do church. While we have church. And I did church. I attended church. I showed up at church. A relationship with God. We're going to look in the mirror this morning. Do you see my mind? Our relationship with God is motivated by return. What do you mean, Pastor Mary? Our motivation... In our relationship with God is the hope that he will return blessings to us. But I don't know. I heard a prophet that said, though the fig tree do not blossom and there be no grapes on the vine, yet will I praise you, oh God. Hosea said it. He said, it doesn't matter what happens in my life. Yes, God will return. And when we seek him first, everything that we need will follow but we chase God to bless us. We worship God to bless us. We tithe for God to bless us. But not because he's God. Not because he's holy. Not because he's righteous. Not because he's worthy of 100% of all of us all the time. Somebody look at your neighbor and say he's worthy of 100% all the time. 
can't hear you, church. Yeah, man, I not feel like worship today. God didn't ask you what you felt like today. When we go into the house of the Lord, we worship. Well, I didn't feel the spirit move. Yeah, if you worship him, you'll feel the spirit move. We wait for a feeling to instruct us instead of the word of God to instruct us. And then we wonder why. Why we have so much trouble in our life. We have built a God that we have made. My God, forgive me into our own image and into our own likeness. And we hear believers using buzzwords like, I'm going to do me. Really? No, you're not going to do you. You're going to do God. Because nowhere in my Bible do I see David saying, I'll do me. Nor when Samson did him, he got into trouble. Every time. I've done me in my life. I get into trouble. Me must die. Somebody. He said to me last week, lay yourself on my altar and stay there. You don't get to do you, Mary. Why? Church has allowed us. We use phrases like this. God understands my life. <laughs> yeah, look at your neighbor and say, he understands your life. So you know what we've done? We put God on the periphery of our life. Oh, it's okay. I don't need the music. And we've given God the leftovers of our time. In the name of grace. Help me God. Somebody shout guilty. And this is what the Lord said to me yesterday. He said, Mary... We've built a house that cannot stand. You know, the Bible says that when we build on the rock and when the wind comes and when the rain comes and when the trouble comes, when we've built... But when we build on the sand and the ideologies and the lies that have been exposed this morning. Guys, last night I was in prayer. And it was like God was saying, Mary, the house, meaning we, we build a house, it just cannot stand. And you see, the enemy tells us it's okay. The enemy tells us it's going to stand. Because we've learned to do things in our mind our power, our wisdom, our strength, and our way. And then last night, the Lord was ministering to you. He said, Mary, it's not going to stand. And I was like, God, why? He said, I won't allow lives built on that to stand. Why? It doesn't look like him. How can we bear the name of Christ? but not look like him. <laughs> Yesterday, the Lord said to me, three houses. Which house are you? 
just want to release this. And as I sat before God and waited on God, he took me to the house of Samson. Judges 14. Let's go Judges 13. 5. For behold, Judges 13, 5, you shall conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Verse 7. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink. Don't eat anything unclean, for the child will be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And when we look at Samson, Samson was called, he was anointed, and he was assigned. I don't know, I'm kind of remembering a psalm that says, Psalm 139, Behold, I have formed you in your mother's. Have we forgotten that we did not choose him? I don't need to shout. I've been shouting all week. Have we forgotten that we did not choose him, but he chose us? It was the Spirit of God that drew us to salvation. Here was Samson. Samson was called, Samson was anointed, and Samson was assigned. Say, call, anointed, and assigned. <laughs> Judges 13 and 14 has it in there. You can read it at home. He was called by God, write it down, to defeat the enemies of Israel. He was anointed by God to totally annihilate the Philistines. And he was assigned by God for victory. The Lord said of Samson, it doesn't matter what man says of you. God said of Samson, Samson, you will deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And the word of God in Judges 13 and 14 says, the spirit of the Lord began to move on Samson. And we see in Judges 14, with the jawbone of a donkey, he killed hundreds or thousands of men. So here you have a man. He was called. He was anointed. He had an assignment in the nation. God gave him strength. He was handsome. He was good looking. But his strength lay in his obedience. Lord, help me. But Samson traded his calling for honey. He traded his calling for alcohol. He traded his calling to touch what he should not touch, to be where he should not be, to entertain what he should not entertain. He rather touch what he shouldn't have touched, entertain what he should not have entertained, Consume what he should not have consumed. Then walk in his calling and his anointing and his mandate. Listen to me, church. This is our reality. I'm not preaching to you. Much of the modern day church feels that they can keep their calling, keep their anointing, keep their assignment and it just walks alongside 
them touching what they shouldn't touch, entertaining what we should not entertain, and consuming what we should not consume. I want to stay there. Much of the modern day church, we've been lied to by pulpits that preach prosperity. And yes, God can prosper you. And yes, God will prosper you. But he doesn't prosper mess. And much of the modern day church has redefined God. I'm called. I'm anointed. I'm assigned. The power of God is with me. But right up beside you, your wine. Right up beside you, your drink. Right up beside you, you're, we're consuming what we should not be consuming on social media. We are entertaining. How can we worship God and listen to? on Saturday night yeah man the music sweet and we feed our spirit with the songs of Babylon and the songs of Babylon are in our heart and then we come into church and we think our praise is going to bring the enemy down you know the enemy says good show good show look at Judges 16:20. I want to release this accurately. Nearly done. What happened to Samson? He touched what he shouldn't touch. He consumed what he shouldn't consume. He entertained what. You see, we don't like this kind of preaching. But I'm going to preach it because it's the word of God. It applies to me, it applies to us. And there's some enemies oh, in our nation. Let me just go here before I go there. There's some enemies in our nation that need to come down. I can't hear you. A lot of us, our children, are not really walking with God. Premarital sex, sexual immorality, and all that goes with it that I won't call out from this pulpit. In the locker rooms and in the bathrooms of our schools, our children are, they might not be, they're, they're doing things that they should not be doing. Come on now, where's the outrage? Where's the outcry? While we do a good youth ministry and we play a ball and we lick a volleyball, but they don't know how to stand against the enemy. They don't know how to pull the enemy down. Oh, don't get too deep with our children. They won't understand. Babylon has gotten deep with them. Help me cry out. While we do our program. Look at this. So look at this. Let me just unpack it. So Samson, I just want you to get this principle. Samson traded. Listen, this man was called to defeat the armies of Israel. Guys, the church is called to bring down the enemy over our cities, over... Help me. We were saved. You know, the Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. So let, let me make sure I get this principle out to you. Here is Samson. He's called. He's anointed. He's appointed to bring down the, 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 the Philistines. And he trades in. How many of us has traded in our calling? 
No music. You see, the modern day church has trained the people of God to think. I'm going to walk down here to anybody that's sleepy and slappy, so open your eyes. Open your eyes before I do it. And give honor to God. Or go home and sleep. But we're not going to have it in this house. It's dishonorable to God and to me and to the Spirit of God. Stop. Samson traded in his calling and his anointing and his assignment to touch what he shouldn't have touched, to entertain what he shouldn't have entertained. Look at this. And to consume what he shouldn't have consumed. Do you know what happened to Samson? The very thing that he was called to destroy took him captive. You see, whatever we want, whatever we refuse to deal with in our life that is an enemy to God will take us captive. You don't get that. I refuse to confront these idols in my life. Guess what? That very thing is going to take you captive. All of a sudden, you're going to begin to serve the thing you refuse to confront. My God, lift your right hand and say, this is the hour of confrontation. I have to confront everything in my life that is an enemy to God. If I don't confront the things in my life that are an enemy to God, they will take me captive. And then, let's put up the scripture in Judges 6. And then, Judges 16, 20. And Delilah said to Samson, my God, am I communicating clearly? That's all. He said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. So he awoke from his sleep and he said, I'm going to go out at before. At other times. And I'm going to shake myself free. But he did not know that God had departed from him. How much of the modern day church says, I'm going to go and shake myself free. Samson could no longer confront what he entertained. And the anointing left him. God departed from him. Do we want to keep doing church as usual? My God, somebody tell me. Talk back to me, TCMI. Do we want to do church as usual? Do we want to continue in the way that we've continued? I've been repenting all week. I've been crying out to God. I've been saying to God, I don't want this anymore. How can we confront in our lives and bring down the Philistines when they're in our bedroom? They're in our mind. They're in our business. They're in our homes. Which house are we? Are you, am I, the house of Samson? Last point. I just feel led to do, you know, to release this last point. The house of Eli. Lift your right hand. Say, Eli was called. Eli was anointed. 
And Eli was assigned. Come on, say it again. Help me out. Lift your hands. Say, Eli was called. Eli was anointed. And Eli was assigned. Eli was a priest. Listen to his calling, anointing, and assignment. Eli was called, <laughs> Lord help me, by God to minister unto God in sacrifice and worship as a priest. Hold on. Stop. Quiet. Guys, our first ministry as Christians. Is not prophecy. Our first ministry to God is worship and intercession. Guys, we have sung the songs of the flesh to minister to our soul. We can't go on like this. Eli was called to minister to God in worship and to minister to God in intercession. He was anointed by God, listen to this, to be God's representative. Can you just shout that word representative? representative. To a nation. And to give guidance to a nation. He was assigned by God. To raise up a Samuel generation. And the word of God says this. God said this in 1 Samuel 2, 28. We don't need to go there, but it's there. He said, did I not choose Eli to be my priest? He chose Eli. To serve in the house of God, to offer sacrifices to God, to offer prayer and to offer worship and incense to God. To offer up intercession for the nation and for the people of the nation. To know the mind and the heart of God for the people of Israel. But as I dug into scripture, my heart just feels absolutely broken. Eli traded... His calling. And he traded his anointing. And he traded his assignment to lower the standards for his sons. Eli was spiritually lazy. He loved food and he loved to eat. And he did his own thing. And instead of his calling, his anointing, and his assignment, he said, listen, I will not confront Hophni and Phinehas. I won't confront my sons. I'll let them do what they want. I'll let them behave the way they want. Do you know we live in a church that none of us like confrontation, but hallelujah, the word of God comes to confront us all. Somebody say glory. Oh, you, I think you can do better than that. The word of God does not come to appease my flesh. The word of God does not come to tell me how great I am. The Bible says, he says, the word of God tells us that we have to lay our flesh. Paul says, it is no longer I I'm nearly done. It's okay. You can persevere a little bit more. The word of God says, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives inside of me. Touch yourself. Say, it's no longer I. We need to get the I out of our worship. We need to get the I out of our intercession. We need to get the I out of our services. It's no longer I. It's Christ. Who lives in me. And so Eli. Was selfish and self-centered. 
And he traded his calling, his anointing, and his assignment for personal gain. My God, this could preach. And privilege. His motive for worshiping was personal gain. His motive for prayer was personal gain. Guys, do you know that many of us have not been trained? And Lord, I take responsibility, but we're not going to continue this way. That our motive for prayer is to get things from God. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but our motive for prayer is not to glorify him. And in the discipleship session that we did on Friday, listen, when we give unto the Lord the glory to his name and he inhabits the praises of his people, I just feel to release this. When we pray and worship to give him glory and not to feel good, to lift him up, to exalt him, he says, those that come before me have to have clean hands and a pure heart. We, 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 we should not have offered up our soul to an idol. But the Bible says that when we give him high praise, and this is not a sanky song to appease our It's glorifying him, magnifying him, ascribing unto God the glory due his name. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. And one of the things we looked at Friday, listen. Praise, high, holy praise was Jehoshaphat's weapon. High, holy praise was David's weapon. Why? High, listen to this. High, holy praise was Paul and Silas's weapon. Guys, think about this. Paul and Silas could not cut those prison bars. But once they lifted him. And he came. He didn't just open their prison bars. He opened every prison bar in the house. Why some of us are fighting things we should not fight. We're fighting the enemy. Where if we access a presence, access a glory, the presence and the glory will set us free. So, help me Lord. Elal! 1 Samuel 2 verse 12 says this. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. What does it mean when it said they did not know the Lord? You know what it said? They didn't fear him. They didn't obey him. And they didn't honor him. I'm not going to preach another message. But I need, we need to ask ourselves, do we fear him? Do we obey him? And do we honor him? It says in 1 Samuel 2 verse 14, they would take for themselves all the flesh and the meat. And verse 17, I'm going to ask you to put it up. 1 Samuel 2 verse 17. It said this. Just leave this scripture up, please. The sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. Now I want us to hold on. Please leave that up. Are we the house of Eli? Have we worshipped our programs, our platforms, and personalities more? Have we refused to confront the flesh to accommodate a good service? Are we lazy in correcting what's wrong? 
Do we refuse to call out sin? Our sin. Have we used God for personal gain? Have we lost the fear of God and become familiar with church life? Have we made our obedience to God debatable and dependent on our schedule? Have we traded our calling to minister unto God in prayer, worship, and intercession for a feel-good service on Sunday? And a life that says, I'll do what I'll do. Have we traded our calling to be ambassadors of heaven? And God's representatives in a nation for a life of compromise and convenience. Have we traded our assignment to raise up a Samuel generation? For the acceptance of man, popularity with man, and with the public. Have we raised up Hophni and Phineas? Have we raised up a generation? Look, come on, we're going to speak truth because we're not going to stay here. Have, you know what they said is Hophni? They kicked at the offering of God. Come on, let's talk. I don't want to go to church, mommy. I mean, I like how church is. I mean, I want praise. Have we raised up a generation that's Hophni and Phineas? They don't, they're not zealous for the name of God. <laughs> they don't even understand their weapons. But they read daily bread. What are we doing? doing in this nation God judged and don't go here I want to leave this here as I close 1 Samuel 3 verse 14 God said of the house of Eli he said the iniquity of Eli's house can never be atoned by sacrifice and offering. And I want to leave with this, and I honestly don't know how to close. I just know that I've obeyed God. But as I sat before God, I said, God, why was your judgment on Eli so harsh? He said he will never atone for Eli's house. The, there is no atonement. The word never. And I said, God, you see, God redeemed Samuel. And I said, God, I mean, this is a severe judgment. Why were you so harsh on Eli? And the Lord took me to this. And he said, Mary, here in lies the key. Let's read this. The sin of Eli's sons was very great before the Lord. Hold on. Let me work, walk you through it. Because for men, the nation, the nation abhor the church. Why? Because the church did not accurately represent God to the nation. I just know 
the God wants us to move from here. Is that not the state? The nation looks at the church. That's why we're a bunch of hypocrites. We kill each other's wounded. And the list goes on and on. And what we offer unto God is mixed with flesh, mixed with profane fire, and it's self-seeking and self-centered. Listen. I'm not going to get into this this morning, but I guess I'll leave it with this. As I began to read in Judges and as I began to read in 1 Samuel and go back in the context of this, you see how God raised up judges and prophets. Help me, Lord. That told the people of Israel, return to God. Hold on. And I believe that there's a place in all of our hearts that we have to return to God. But this is, this is what I want you to hear. Because I'm going to go here probably next week. Israel had gone so far astray. The God needed more than just a prophet or a judge. And so he looked for a king after the order of Melchizedek. Look for a man that was after God's heart, that was jealous for him, that knew how to worship him on the backside of the desert. Lord, how do I explain this? He said, listen, I needed a man that didn't just call the people of Israel back to God. But I needed a man that would bring God back to the people of Israel. There's a massive difference. What do you mean by that? He needed a man that was so not for a program, not for a church, but for him that said, I refuse to rule as king without the ark in our midst. Guys, quickly as I close, David said, I've got to take God, the ark, back into the midst of the land. Look at me. We're doing church without the ark. They let everywhere the ark went. The Philistines stole the ark and it judged them. I'm going to preach on this next week. And then the ark was moved to help me out. Kareth Jerem and it judged them. And Dagon fell down on his face before the ark. Listen, when the ark, meaning 
the manifest presence of God visits us, it's going to judge flesh. What does that mean? Everything that's not of God in your life has to go. You're going to get delivered. But David was jealous for God. And he said, I've got to restore the ark to the nation. Guys, I'm just giving you what God gave me. We have to restore the ark to this house. To my life. To our life. Hold on, I want to release this. And we see in scripture that David's zeal got the best of him and he put the ark on oxen. And as I dug into this, guys, the ark carried the glory. Say it with me. Say the ark. ark. Carried the glory. glory. Say what is the glory? glory? Say the manifest Manifest. presence Presence. and power Power. of God God. that brings transformation. It brings judgment and the same ark that judged brought blessing. Where the ark is, you don't need to ask to be blessed. The presence blesses. The presence deals with the enemy. The presence defeats the enemy. And so David, in his zeal, and we'll go here next week by his grace, he put the ark on the back of oxen. And I was asking God, I was like, God, what what does this mean? You know, like, he, he had good intent. Say, good intent doesn't cut it when you're dealing with glory. I can't hear you, but that's okay, Marvin. I can't hear you. Good intent doesn't cut it with God. You see, we've, we've come into this understanding of the modern nature, but my heart was right. Say, boom, 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 devil, you're a liar. And I said, God, what does this represent? And he said, Mary, the ark, the presence, the glory was never intended to be carried by a thing. Uh, I need to stay there. Uh, I need to stay there. A program cannot carry the glory. A good church service that's well crafted cannot carry the glory. The glory was never intended to be carried by a thing. A personality cannot carry the glory. A good anointing cannot carry the glory. An Uzzah and his well-meaning self reached out and God set a standard and he said no, why? For God must be honored and his boundaries must be established. He is not like us. And his boundaries must be established in the eyes of all Israel. And David was puzzled. He said, God, what did I do wrong? And he went back and he found the prescribed manna. Say, prescribed manna. Guys, we have to be willing to comply with the prescribed manner and standard of heaven. 
And the Bible says, he put the ark on the shoulders of the priests. Who are the priests of our generation? Me? Who? Who are the priests? You see, we've been lulled into thinking our significance is when we have a mic. Give audience to my gifts. The priest is every blood-washed saint. And we don't need a mic to execute our priestly duties. And we don't need our platform. And David said every 10 steps. They stopped. Sometimes you got to stop. And they sacrificed. And they worshiped unto God. This morning... I believe that God wants to ask us the question individually, not corporately. Because it's what the individual brings that makes it corporate. He wants to ask us individually, have you allowed yourself, your house, to become the house of Samson. Have you traded your power and your authority over the enemy to touch what you shouldn't touch, consume what you shouldn't consume? Have we allowed our house to become the house of Eli? Where we have watered down God to our children and to those that we have been stewarded to raise, that we have produced a generation that does not know God, nor the ways of God. I just believe we don't need any drama in here this morning. And we're not looking for an emotional response. But I believe that the word of God has come to align us and to set us free, that we may set our house in order. Some of us are Samuels. Some of us are Eli's. And I just charge you this morning. God put them there so that we wouldn't make the same mistake. God exposed them so terribly so that we would know better. This morning... I honestly don't know how to close, and we need to take up an offering and take up communion. But if this morning, and I'm not asking for all to call, I don't believe God wants an all to call, and I don't believe this is about any drama, but I believe that this is an opportunity to say to him, I don't want to be of the order of Samuel. And I don't want to be of the order of Eli. Sa Samson. Sorry, I don't want to be of the order of Samson. And I don't want to be of the order of Eli. I want to be of the order of David. And if this morning, the sincerity of your heart before God Says, God, I give you full permission and right to make me of the order of David. I'm not even going to ask you to stand because peer pressure is going to make those stand that don't want to really stand. I'm going to ask you to remain seated. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. But I am going to ask you to close your eyes and to lift your hands before a holy God who saved us to represent him to a nation, 
who saved us to raise up a generation. And guys, I have just been repenting. That's the honest to God truth. I have just been crying out to God. I said, I have just been asking him for mercy and to give me the strength. It's not easy to raise teenagers. It's not easy to raise children. It's not easy when the things you've accepted, all of a sudden you don't accept them anymore. To explain, it's just not easy. But if we don't contend for everything that's an enemy for God, we're going to lose a generation. I'm going to invite you just to lift your hands.